true. But uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for staying for the talk and introduction. And uh, I'm Nagi Rao, and this is joint work with uh, Nina Imam, Jesse Henry, and um, Sar. Uh, this is uh, a study of uh, taking luster to real long distances, and we needed a point solution for one of our sponsors. So this is not meant to be a, a general solution for, uh, or a general uh, kind of a, a framework for uh, you know, supporting luster or long haul, but it's a more like a point solution. I'll ba basically uh, talk about uh, the configurations and uh, luster over ethernet. Uh, then I'll talk about our test configuration and measurements, and we'll discuss uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, impacts of uh, uh, the uh, various parameters. So uh, these are just you know, real basics. Uh, the main thing to notice is that, uh, let me see the, okay, uh, is that I'm actually trying to mount, run luster clients on a, a compute host, which is actually a part of a compute cluster. That's one class of hosts. And the other one is the, what, are, what we call the data transfer nodes. These are the nodes that are only used for uh, data transfer purposes. These are two different types of nodes. And I wanted to support Lustre clients on these two types of uh, uh, nodes, actually. And this is just the cartoon version. I think it's very, I just put it just to clarify wh what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a Lustre over IB. And you have the clients here. I have the compute type of client here. And then I have the DTN type of uh, client here. Uh, so why do we need wide area um, uh, Luster. It is, a, uh, it is one of the uh, problems that we had to solve for one of the sponsors. They actually had to mount Luster over wide area across country. Uh, but then we looked at it. Uh, one of the reasons why they wanted to do is they really did not want to use sp special purpose file transfers over this wide area, actually. You could actually transfer the files and then use them locally. But uh, that requires, uh, you know, tools like uh, Grid FTP, Espera, XTD, or others, actually. So you need to configure them and use them. And uh, the other one is that if you mount the clusters over wide area, you can actually use any apps that, uh, that you are running on clusters that actually access file systems. And right now, uh, there is this concept of super facility. They, we want to use VMs over uh, uh, super computing facilities that are distributed across the country. And we would like to have the ability to move the uh, software between the VMs. If that's the case, if you have file accesses, you actually have to move the files with them. So if you are able to mount it in, in certain cases, uh, then you really can run the uh, code almost transparently. That's another application. But most of the uh, installations that I am familiar with are actually uh, IV-based uh, side installations. And that's the installation we actually wanted to export it over long haul. So the, one of the main things is that uh, we have the timeout of the IB, 2.5 milliseconds. So then we actually needed to uh, get around it. Uh, we can get VAN accelerators. Uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, Obsidian makes them. Uh, you can actually uh, extend IB, almost what looks like a native extension, but they're extremely expensive. You need to bookend each connection with, uh, with, uh, with one of those devices, actually. So the, the, what we would like to use is uh, Lustro or Ethernet. It is not as widely deployed among the uh, deployments that I'm familiar with. Uh, but now, once you do use this, uh, then the traffic goes over IP networks. Then you have to deal with TCP and its dynamics over long hauls. Okay. So this is just the cartoon version of it. This is IB, so, uh, the client and the server. And if you can actually mount it on Ethernet, actually, you can go a longer distance. When you do this, you are actually going over, uh, over Ethernet. But the configuration we are interested in is this. We do have a, a, a Luster file system mounted on a local site. It's an IB-based system. We want to extend it over Ethernet to, uh, actually, uh, to a, a wide area network here. So LNet router is what we use as a more or less a media converter in this case. Uh, So it looks like this in a cartoon version. I have the server here, and I have Ethernet switch here. I have LNet routers here. This is my Lustre uh, file system, actually. So it looks very simple in the, in the uh, cartoon version like this. But if you map it onto the wide area network, this is how it looks like now. Uh, we have the wide area part, which looked like a simple connection now, uh, actually goes over TCP network. Okay? Especially if you have this f file system here, 
and you have LNET, uh, LNET router, and if you're using parallel TCP, you're actually going over parallel TCP here, you're doing actually uh, doing the, uh, the client here, and if you map it onto network, this is how it looks like, actually. This, you have this, this system here, and this system here. The performance now is, uh, it's actually quite challenging now because we have to deal with the TCP dynamics, which are actually complicated by, the, by themselves. And now we have to do the luster uh, dynamics. And now, more importantly, the interaction between the two, you will see you know, how it plays out. These are the, this is our setup. I won't go much into details, uh, except it, the, the, most of the tests that I'll describe are on our test bed, which actually has a fairly small cluster file system mounted on it. And these are LNET parameters, and the, the, these buffer sizes. The TCP, uh, typically, uh, cubic is the uh, default uh, stack uh, um, on, the, uh, uh, on, on most, of the TCP, uh, most of the Linux installations now. But Hamilton TCP is what is recommended for uh, data transfer nodes, actually. If you look at the DOE, DTNs, that, this is what you'll find. Uh, they do have quite a bit of uh, different performance differences, especially if you are going into long haul distances. So just a uh, very quick, uh, I do talk about IO zone measurements. I can, uh, this is one way of measuring the throughput. I actually look at the profiles here because it's, uh, it's illustrated to discuss about the qualitative aspects of it. This is the transfer size, this is the segment size. In this case, this is actually an OLCF cluster file system. Uh, if you run in a single stream, uh, uh, the, this is the IOZone reads, uh, and then it, it's about 10 gigabits per second. Uh, this is bits per second because this is in the network language. And uh, the reason I put it here is that I'm, I'm going to be talking about 10 gigabit uh, long haul connections. And this one, if you, if you drive it with this, this is not a choke point for, the, uh, for this uh, transfer. So the IO zone gives you a lot of other things too. I only talk about uh, you know, uh, writes, but you can talk about reads, you can talk about F writes and F reads and so on. They all have different, uh, uh, different profiles and uh, depending on how it's configured, you get these buffer related peaks and then uh, various complicated geometries. Actually, I won't go into the, all the details of it. We just stay with this bare bones uh, kind of uh, uh, me measurement here. But you can, one can get into details of this and also, one has to interpret uh, the measurements in the context of the rest of your system, actually, because it depends on the, uh, the way you, the file system is configured. So what we did is we did a simple measurement. This is, the, uh, this is my data server, and I did the throughput measurement. This, the IO right here actually gives me 6 gigabits per second. And on the uh, compute node, it actually gives me slightly less, actually. This is a regular native uh, IV uh, installation. So these are the specifics of my test host. I will just put it on my slides if anybody is interested for later on, but uh, there's nothing really uh, um, nothing, uh, remarkable about them. So then what we wanted to do is we want to systematically test it. We have a luster file system mounted locally in IB, and we have that performance here. Compared to that, if you actually have a luster file system mounted on a remote site, what would be the, uh, what would be the difference and what would be the considerations? First thing is we are introducing LNET routers here. We wanted to actually systematically go over and see what is happening in terms of the, the profile as I introduce LNET routers in different configurations. First thing we did is we just did the LNET router uh, on the IB network itself. This is actually, there's no media conversion here. IB to IB, and you compute the profiles. It looks like it has a very little impact, so there is no really overhead in actually using uh, LNET router in this configuration. So what happens now if I do the media conversion? So what we do here is, you have the server here, LNET router here, I'm doing a media conversion here from IB to Ethernet. This is just a single switch, it's still a local transfer. If you do the performance profiling, it looks like there's not much, uh, dif uh, much impact either. So, so far, the media conversion is not really taking a, uh, uh, taking a toll on it, and this LNET router is not taking a toll on it. So that part is done. Then what we did was we actually put in more devices in the Ethernet side. Actually, I actually connected to a big Nexus, Nexus switch. And so here, uh, this is LNET router. It's actually, if the client actually goes over Ethernet here, a multi-hops Ethernet, and then accesses the server. Or, so if it, it turns out that there's not much uh, difference here either. So this configuration seems to be that, uh, uh, seems to be fairly well balanced in the sense that Introducing LNET router, media conversion, and so on does not seem to uh, impact these uh, profiles drastically. Actually, they seem to be uh, uh, they seem to be preserved well. And 
Next, what we did is we actually took it to Atlanta, from Oak Ridge to Atlanta. So this one went all the way to Atlanta and came back. It's 11.6 milliseconds. Okay. Here, this is a, a long haul connection here. This is when you actually t see the impact of the interaction between TCP and luster. If you look at the throughput, uh, look at now. Now we actually, from six gig, uh, gig to, I went down to five, and then for this, five to, I went down to three. Not only that, the throughput themselves are actually are much lower here. This, there are also a couple of things going on here. The throughput calculation itself folds in the latency. Latency is very high. So if you fold that in, you'll actually get the calculated value to be low. But if you stay with that calculation, you can actually see by the time you went to long haul, all the profiles actually have significantly got reduced. Okay. So this is the first thing that we did for long haul. But nevertheless, you can actually, you can actually see, you can actually sustain four gigabits. Uh, you know, to, this is about uh, a 500 mile distance, actually. We can uh, sustain four gigabit kind of a bulk throughput on it in this mode. So next is now we want to go to longer and longer distances. To do this, uh, what we have is an emulation test bed, a hardware emulation test bed at Oak Ridge. It actually, uh, we have devices that actually delay the packets based on the RTT and deliver them. They, are, they, they emulate hardware delivery, and you can actually go all the way up to, actually, uh, you, you can emulate them up to 0 to 366 milliseconds. Actually, they can go up to 800 milliseconds, essentially a couple of satellite hops but I only uh, use it to 0 to 366 actually around the earth connections actually. So the configuration looks like this. Actually, I have the router, LNET router here, plugged into the switch here, and then I have this emulator here. So if I trace a path here, this RTT can be anywhere between 0 to 366. Okay. This is the summary of all the results that I have. I'll discuss them in, uh, in detail further, but if you go from left to right, what we have is actually the throughput uh, on the X-axis, I have the RTT in log scale. This is the local, which is the same thing as what I showed you in the profile. Once you go to 11 milliseconds, it went to three, and then it actually keeps on decreasing here. This is round the earth. Okay? If you go around the earth, you actually still get, and get about a half a gigabit per second of throughput, actually. This is, uh, uh, if, you are, uh, if you are okay with that kind of rates, actually this is, you can mount it and you can get those kind of throughputs. Another thing is from left to right, uh, these, are, these are the uh, data transfer nodes, and then using the cubic as the TCP, and uh, these are the LNET router buffers, buffer sizes. They did not seem to make much difference, and it will come to this. But I want you to notice that the shape of this profile in every case is convex. That has a uh, uh, significant impact on the analytics, which I'll talk next. So this is actually a, just a file throughput. I just co computed the iperf measurements. Remember, four, uh, six gig is the uh, uh, file throughput. 10 gig is the memory, memory to memory throughput. And this is RTT. This, these are the distances around the country, and this is around the globe. This is around the globe, actually. So you can actually see the profile has this nice uh, kind of a concave behavior. Then it actually becomes convex. Okay. What the concave behavior means is that the TCP is allowed to grow fully with its dynamics. So there's no kind of restriction on it. But if there is any kind of restriction, like either a buffer restriction or an IO restriction or a rate rest restriction, you actually get the convex behavior like this. In this case, it's a buffer uh, restriction. The buffer is big enough up to about 100 milliseconds. Afterwards, it actually switches to convex. So these are the, uh, the these are the throughputs for the uh, wide area for the uh, uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the 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 state cl uh, client, which is actually the uh, the part of the cluster node. Okay. Now, if you put the TCP side by side with uh, with uh, the through file transfer throughput, this is how it looks like. The minimum I get out of TCP throughput is six gigabits per second. The maximum I get out of the uh, luster throughput is actually less than six gigabits per second. You can align this. Okay. So initially what we thought was, since I'm getting six gigabit per second throughput with TCP throughput, when I hook it up with this, I should be just able to maintain it. And uh, the reason we are not able to do it is there is a very close interaction between the luster and TCP that actually modulates the dynamics of TCP. That's precisely what actually gives us this, con this kind of a convex behavior. 
So this is actually, uh, we wanted to see what happens if I change one TCP versus the, uh, versus the other. This is cubic versus Hamilton TCP. Between these two TCP versions, actually there doesn't seem to be much difference because the throughput is already much lower than what I was able to get at the peak when you hook up the lustres at both ends. So because of that, I think TCP version did not make much of a difference. It probably would make a difference if you have, a, if, if you have a actually luster throughput much higher, but you are actually bottlenecked by TCP. So this is for the uh, Tate node. It's essentially the same story here. Uh, the, the TCP throughput looks like this, and then the luster throughput looks, looks like this, and this is the midpoint here. The TCP, uh, there is one thing that, uh, so for Hamilton TCP, you can actually take a look at this one. Uh, it's actually the same story here. I can actually get up to six on the, uh, the data transfer nodes, and then uh, this is the, the peak, the last throughput, and then this is the alignment point, actually. Okay. So this is the kind of the profile summary. What I did was I actually plotted the kind of profiles that I showed you, different RTTs. This is the profile I showed you earlier, which is the local profile. As you increase RTT, this is how it looks like. Okay? And finally, uh, when you go to round the earth, it actually looks like a peak, and it's actually, the, uh, the peak is around one gigabit per second, actually. Okay? Not only that, the, the entire throughput rate actually goes down, partly because of the rate, and partly because the way it is calculated, because when you actually, when the IOZone does it, it actually falls into the latency, which is actually a very big number in this case. So you need to take that into the, in the, in the context, actually. So I wanted to say one thing. Uh, if we're going to remote mount luster file system onto, uh, onto nodes that are part of a cluster, the first thing we have to do is actually make sure the TCP stack is tuned. So what I did was I actually ran the TCP throughput on my cluster node, and it turns out that the TCP itself is below one gigabits per second because it wasn't tuned. So when we actually I had to go and actually tune the TCP, once I tuned the TCP, then it actually went up. So the reason I'm saying this is if we remote mount a luster file system or long haul onto, a, onto an HPC node or a, like a cluster node, and if you don't tune the uh, TCP stack properly, you probably are seeing the limits of TCP, not the luster file system. Okay, this is the same thing once I tune, uh, tune the TCP stack. And again, the, the TCP itself is uh, not performing as well on the state nodes compared to the DTNs because uh, the transfer nodes are actually have more CPU cores on it. It's a, it's a system that's actually built for data transfers, whereas this is a system that's built for computation. So it wasn't surprising that its TCP is not as good. Nevertheless, uh, you know, the, the throughput is actually lower when you talk about the uh, uh, luster throughput. This is the next case for the cubic. So you can actually compare the, compare the cases of uh, the, th this is the data transfer node and this is the computation node, the computation with cubic. You can actually put them side by side. It turns out that the two TCP, uh, the throughput is similar for uh, both uh, Hamilton TCP and cubic for the Tate for this case actually. Network throughput is higher for uh, Hamilton TCP, but does not seem to make a difference as far as the luster throughput is concerned, because already you are clipped by the luster throughput itself. So what we did was we actually uh, looked, we thought, because we are seeing this type of behavior, we thought the, the, the causes for this is somehow the TCP is actually getting uh, clamped down by luster throughput. Initially, we thought it's because of the LNet router buffer, because typically what happens is when the TCP buffers are small, that's when you actually see a throughput profile which is convex like this. That was our initial guess. When we changed the LNet, uh, uh, LNet buffer size to 2G, it didn't really make a difference. So that wasn't, the, uh, that wasn't actually the choke point for the transfers now. So it turns out that it's actually peer credits that are the choke points here. So to analyze that, we actually have to compare what is happening with the TCP and it, the TCP dynamics uh, in terms of when you hook up the luster. So if you look at the TCP, this is actually TCP by itself for memory transfers, eight streams. This is actually, a, uh, the stripe count is actually eight for these transfers. So what you could do is you can actually analytically fit a function 
here, which is actually a concave region. In fact, we tune the TCP to get this concave region. So essentially, typically, what we do is we actually increase the buffers as much as possible and, in, and then increase the parallel streams. That actually gives you this concave region. The, there are, there are uh, at least two nice things about concave regions. The, first of all, the TCP is allowed to grow as much in terms of its dynamics, so your throughput is higher. And the thing is, from a prediction point of view, if you know that it is concave, then you can actually measure the endpoints. By looking at the endpoints, you know that the throughput is at least as good as the linearly interpolated version. You cannot do that if that, uh, the profile is not actually concave. If the profile is convex, only thing you can guarantee is that your throughput will be, in the, in the middle, will be at least as high as the lowest of them. Okay? So there are two aspects of it, both the prediction part as well as the throughput part. You can actually fit a fun sigmoid function like this. Actually, that will give you the transition point where you have the convex and uh, concave. But here, the only thing that we have is the convex. Okay? It turns out that the, uh, as I said, it wasn't the LNET buffer that was the, uh, that was the cause, as I showed you. We increased it from actually 65K uh, all the way up to 2 gig. And that didn't seem to make a much difference. We actually measured in between two. So the, uh, the, the main thing is that it is the credits. And we actually we are in the process of increasing the credits and run the next type of uh, measurements. We actually had to, uh, we had to actually uh, essentially redo our configuration. That's why uh, we're in the process of measuring this. But this actually gives us uh, the concrete, the shape actually tells us where to look for. Okay. So if the luster is not a, a bottleneck when you hook up the luster systems together, then you actually should see a TCP profile like this. So you can flip it around and you get the profile like this. And if it is giving a, a convex profile, that means there is a bottleneck I.O. or bottleneck somewhere. You can actually analytically show that. Okay. Initially, I showed this for uh, TCP. And uh, I th initially thought that uh, I could show it uh, for TCP using the buffer limits. Okay. But we, I for sure know that the buffer limits are not the issue here. Because of that, uh, what I did is actually had to generalize it to an I.O. rate limit. It turns out to be fairly simple. It's not. not uh, turns out to be fairly simple to show. This is the bandwidth delay product that you have. This is the capacity. This is RTT. And you have a limit here, which is below the bandwidth delay product. If you have, uh, if your buffer is limited below bandwidth delay product, then actually you can compute the average uh, throughput. And then you can actually a compute the average throughput within a, uh, within a window. And then you just take the first derivative of it. If it actually is an increasing function of tau, that implies the concavity, uh, sorry, convexity. So this is a way to mathematically show this. And then it actually turns out that in this case, uh, you can flip it around. If you are seeing uh, the, uh, you compute the profile, and if you are seeing the convex profile, you can actually see that you are choked somewhere, either at the TCP, like I showed you for the, uh, the, cl uh, the cluster node case, or it could be uh, within the system that is actually feeding the TCP. But what is important is the, the reason you are getting this is because of the TCP dynamics. There's really no simple way to decouple TCP dynamics with the luster dynamics, especially in the long haul connections like this, because the packets do come up and then they actually get into TCP flows. From then onwards, TCP dynamics actually uh, will, will be at work, and that's what you need to analyze. With that, uh, what, we, what I talked about is demonstrated that you could mount luster over long haul. And uh, if that's the case, we really don't have to have these dedicated transfer uh, uh, systems, actually, which, which could be quite onerous to actually, uh, some of them are very expensive, and some of them are you know, uh, quite onerous to actually maintain. And the, uh, another important thing is, for certain class of applications, uh, it, if you can mount the uh, luster, at least some portions of it remotely, that, that facilitates your kind of the migration, job migration, without having to worry about actually reloading the files. But the, you need to worry about performance anyway. So this is LNET-based solution. And the measurements are around the earth. I went up to 366. And uh, I think we need uh, more comprehensive analysis, actually. We reached a stage where we know uh, certain things that need, need further investigation, actually. But I think we need to go beyond that. Uh, we will continue to uh, uh, analyze this. And I uh, would appreciate any input from you guys. Uh, any thoughts and suggestions for further testing? With that, uh, I want to say that there is a, a mini symposium 
which talks about issues like this. Uh, it, it, the symposium itself is called data across distance and space. Uh, dis, as a distance meaning, you know, it's actually at different locations. And I'm sorry, space meaning uh, it's, it's at different locations and it's around distance. So please take a look at, uh, look at uh, the website and we would uh, invite you guys to participate. You need to send in a request, there, there are instructions on the website. With that, I thank our sponsors and uh, thank you very much. You mentioned you tune the the, uh, the endpoint clients and the and the routers as well. Besides the peer credits, was there anything else you had to change? Oh, uh, the buffer sizes actually. And but you said I thought you said the buffer sizes didn't end up making much of a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, we found out that they were not. Uh, that's that's all the only thing that we tuned with Luster, right? Do you remember, sir? Yeah, that's the only thing that we. Tuned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think I can. I, I think you guys can think about. I think uh, you know other things that we should be looking at. Actually, this is you know one set of experiments that we did. We're still learning, as as you see. But uh, any thoughts or any suggestions, we would definitely welcome. In your plot, the transition from the concave down to convex down was happening around the 45 millisecond delay. So that among your you know, criteria, it's within the country. So beyond that point, you kind of have a you know, empirical equation which fits the exponential tail, which is uh, relatively easy to explain. Now for the interesting part of a concave down, it may be actually explainable with the simple set of how many routes it jumps over. And then depending on the, because it's sensitive to your credit size, so it may be actually the latency dependent to some simple functional instead of the, you know, the one. So <coughs> if we have some forum for the really long distance uh, discussion, it'll be dominated by the, the tail part of it. But the more interesting, you know, the question we can ask is the, more close distance, for example, from like uh, Illinois to the, like Denver or some, some of the intermediate distance. Yes. Yeah, actually, you're right. I, I a case where the concave and convex transition is prominent. In fact, you, for Hamilton TCP, you can actually extend the, the concave region all the way to 366 by using big buffers. So the, 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 sorry, the concave region, it's entirely concave for Hamilton TCP for, uh, for actually using large buffers actually. So I actually showed it just as, I meant as, meant as an example. This is just an example actually. So this, is the, the, this transition is around 45, but I, the, if this is, I actually intentionally chose an example where I can actually show the transition. But Hamilton TCP actually can be tuned to be the concave, uh, the concave throughout using b big buffers, actually. Good point, yeah. But you think that uh, the routers will make a difference? Uh, 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 So one related thing, for TCP, uh, I have a full-fledged dynamics model. So TCP has exponential increase and then a, a stable uh, congestion control, right? So you can actually mathematically show if you have at least exponential increase and the stable uh, congestion avoidance, then that actually gives you a concave profile. The, uh, and then it, the concave profile increases if you have parallel TCP because what happens is exponential exponential increase actually is kind of added up now. And then also there is more stability in the aggregate throughput. So you can mathematically show that the, uh, the uh, higher buffer sizes, more streams will increase the range of the, uh, the concave region. And uh, you can actually tune them if, you, if your kernel has enough, enough space to 
uh, accommodate big buffers actually. The, but that's a good point actually. Yeah. Uh, so, any thoughts on encryption, best way to handle that? Um, white area, you're going to need to deal with that. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, but what have, interestingly, long haul cryptos increased the throughput performance. We had, a, we were very surprised actually. Uh, but I know, you're talking, if you, but if you're not talking about that level of uh, encryption, you're talking about like an IPsec level, right? Uh, then I think it's, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you're thinking about uh, the TCP level or you think about the file level? Well, so, I mean, it's a general question, like, so where's the right place to have, the right place to, to do the encryption, right? So, because we, you know, they have these wide area IB products, they're expensive, they do encryption, and so you're trying to drive that cost down. So where do we put it? Do we bury it in Lustre? You do it in IPsec, you wrap it in some other way, and how does that affect, you know, so your round trip times? Because you're probably going to have additional jitter in your injection and your uh, consumers. Yeah, uh, if, you use, if, you have, if you have enough funds, the long haul crypto devices are the best, actually. And then they actually surprisingly improve the TCP performance because they have buffers on them. Uh, but other than that, it's an open question. I don't even have a way to think about it. Hi, um, especially for the TCP segment of your transfer, like say on your test uh, to Atlanta, um, are you working in your test with a defined network? In other words, TCP will try to find the best path at any given instant in time. So if you had a defined route from your source to your destination and that was set for all of your tests so you were able to eliminate any other traffic on there for your test results? Apologize. All these are dedicated connections. On ESNet, we actually have the ability to set up uh, 10 gigabit dedicated connections. But that's a good point. In fact, uh, I think if you have additional traffic, it will increase the region of convexity, actually. In fact, uh, this is, in some sense, is the best possible from that perspective. The, but that's a, that's a good point. I should probably make it a point to note that these are dedicated connections. The, uh the point of some of those, you know, Aspera and, and Great FTP tools, from my understanding, is that that write throughput is essentially uh, flat or relatively flat as round trip time increases. So I. I there are two different things. Aspera uses U UDT, sorry, UDP. So they have different congestion control method, but uh, they. Almost any uh, transport will have some decrease with respect to RTT. Uh, the best thing that we have so far on our test bed is the BBR. It has the least decrease in, with respect to RTT. But it's not available in production, uh, production Linux yet as, as, as we speak. Uh, but uh, the, they actually, you can, you actually get plots like this too. You, if you plot with uh, grid F, Grid FTP. We actually have an analysis for Grid FTP. They actually follow uh, similar to this. Actually, the main difference is this: the uh, they follow here because they are not as limited by the the endpoint uh, systems like we are. That is what is giving us the the convexity here. Actually, they are not limited, so they look more like this. Actually, especially if you use multiple uh, multiple uh, the clients and servers. If you are using, for, for example, Grid FTP.